there's been a lot of news in recent <laughs> years and a lot of interesting stories with complicated yeah. characters. Yeah. Why this one? Um, here's an institution which is hostile to feminism where many of the women in, in the institution can't even use the word. And yet these women did a relatively remarkable feminist thing. And it was just a fascinating story. Um, so it, they, they were humans who were complex and complicated and contradictory. Um, we sometimes act, I think, as though um, having a movie made about you is an award we give you in Hollywood. Here's your reward for doing something noble or, or whatnot. But I, what we're really interested in is complicated characters whose, whose internal conflict is unusual. And they had very, very unusual internal conflicts in a way that is rare in you know, a lot of these kinds of media-driven stories. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was it just to be offered that palette of human beings was, was pretty remarkable. Jay, as I understand it, part of how this wound up in your good hands uh, had to do with uh, Charles sharing this script with Charlize, her sharing it with you, and a certain reluctance that you both had. What was that all about? Um, she had some, she'd been attached to it sort of loosely or, or at least had had it in, in, you know, in her office for a, a couple of months and had been trying to figure out how to do it. And she sent it to me just as a friend. We were working on another project and uh, she asked me to just give her some notes. And so I, I wrote up a ton of notes because I was really hooked on the predicament on on what it, uh, what, what it was like a year before the Harvey Weinstein story broke for these women to take on this powerful man and for all the dilemmas that led to him actually being fired by the Murdochs. It's just, it's just an incredibly compelling story. But, um, and, I, and the other thing I said to was I think it's an opportunity to show how nonpartisan the, the issues of sexual harassment are as much as people will come at this with so many predispositions, whichever side you're on, the right will probably be predisposed to think we're just doing a anti-Fox you know, hit job just to just to undo Fox, and the left will probably be skeptical of, of uh, t you know, being asked to go along on this journey with these Fox women, these characters. And I thought that's was that's a, that sounds amazing. Let's let's do that and and try to get it right. Do be authentic about it. Uh, get people past their predispositions. Certainly, go past the media presentations of how those women and and Fox is presented to understand what goes on behind the scenes when they're faced with crises, but also to get past even the women's own, the you know the, these people's own self present you know presentations. They have a, a thing that they have to put forward to fit into Roger Ailes's you know cult of personality. Um, and I I uh, I said all that to her and. I don't know if she was thinking this before she called me, but at the end of the call, she said, I'll do it if you direct it. And I, I, was, I guess I was surprised. I've known Charlize for a while, but I, I think we've only talked about comedies, even though I've mostly done p political films in the past few years. And I guess I maybe it was just self deprecation or something, but I just thought she always saw me as sort of the clown table director. <laughs> so I, I seeing myself as someone to direct Charlize Theron in a drama, I just didn't know I would be at the, at the top of her list on this particular film. So it wasn't hesitancy to, I just honestly was stunned. But I, it, it was up for about five seconds. And then with her and this great script, uh, I said yes right away. And I, I did, you know, we did talk about, well, okay, this is going to be hard. We're going to have to we have a big obligation to get this right. And uh, so those were just natural, ongoing, two years long kind of trepidations, nothing. I never really hesitated about doing it. And John, any trepidations from you for playing this man uh, who, who has some issues, shall we say? <laughs> oh, no, not at all. It was a fantastic uh, character. And uh, when I got a call from my agent out of the blue, I knew nothing about this project. So many elements were already in place. These gentlemen and Jay I'd worked with before and just, we're great friends. <laughs> He's a wonderful man to work with. Charles, you Thank know, you. Oscar winner for The Big Short, who is this great storyteller who had demonstrated how he can untangle an extraordinarily complex story. And Charlize, Nicole, and Margot were already set, so 
before I even read the script, I said yes. I was uh, <laughs> dying to do it and very excited. I don't know at what point in the process they even thought of me for the role. I, uh, I objectively, I'm not that much like Roger Ailes. I, I think it, <laughs> but I think it came in handy that I'd recently played another old, fat, bald man, Winston <laughs> Churchill, so they knew I had it in my kit bag. Yeah. Yeah. But no, no hesitation whatsoever. And I read the script, and it was even better than I expected. Can you talk about, I mean, he, he's a, a bit of a corpulent kind of guy. You had to go through quite a transformation. Can you talk about, I mean, the, the makeup in this film it's, is, it's is really something, and how that affected your performance when you were able to see yourself in all of that? Well, uh, I assume there are a lot of actors in the audience tonight. It, it's always an incremental process. Uh, I had these incredible confederates, Colleen Atwood, who's done a lot of Tim Burton's films. Uh, she does amazing things with bodies, not just costumes, but bodies. We spent lots and lots of time getting the body exactly right and just how far we should go. I mean, he, he was a big, ungainly, obese man, and uh, I was all for that. Uh, I you gained was 300 pounds. It was pretty impressive yes, that you gained all that weight. Just, just, just <laughs> No, it was all fat. It was all fat. Just by zipping it up in the back. Uh, I was very skeptical about prosthetic makeup. I I just, uh, one very ironic story. I had played Churchill with nothing at all glued on my face. I did have a a wig that made me look even more bald than I am. But the only prosthesis was inside, in my jowls and up my nose. and simultaneously, Gary Oldman was playing Churchill with loads of prosthetic makeup designed by Kazuhiro, who became my... Uh, and that was a tremendous Oscar-winning makeup job. And Jay gave me confidence, and he also... He just said, look, let's experiment with it. Let's see what happens. And I spent a very exciting day in Kazu's extraordinary studio, and I, I just couldn't believe my eyes when we were done. Not only the look of it, but the way it felt on my face or didn't feel at all. It just felt like me. And if I would shake my head, my huge double chin would waggle back and forth like a turkey. It was so extraordinarily realistic. So you just do all those things on the outside, and it makes you feel very different on the inside. A certain uh, humiliation and self-loathing kicks in. One of the most fascinating things is that Roger Ailes was not necessarily seen as a complete and utter monster. It was actually very well liked by a lot of folks. John, what what do you make of the guy now that you've had the chance to sit in his skin for a bit? Well, uh, I've told this story quite often. I, I the the most uh, interesting and revealing piece of work I did in preparing to play the role it was tracking down an old friend of mine from the 1970s who had worked as Roger's producing partner when Roger was attempting to be a theater producer in New York. A fun fact, Roger Ailes produced the the premiere production of Hot El Baltimore by Lanford Wilson, a significant piece of Pulitzer Prize winning drama. He was also starting his media consultancy with uh, political candidates. My friend Stephen Rosenfield, back in those days, was working with him 12 12 hours a day on both of these enterprises, and they were very good friends. And he said, nobody nobody says a word about what great company Roger Ailes was. But, you know, his very edgy and ironic sense of humor, most revealing of all, he could be very tough on his own political candidate clients for being too conservative too hard-assed right-wing and, ha- and lacking in empathy. Uh, I, I, we had like this 40-minute conversation with him telling me these amazing stories about a totally different Roger Ailes. And I couldn't wait. We'd already started shooting. But you remember, I couldn't wait to get to Jay and Charles and tell them about these tales. Uh, it's not that I was trying to make him more sympathetic. I just wanted there to be more to him than just a, a despicable villain. Uh, I mean, everybody, whenever I, when I told anyone that I was about to play Roger Ailes or that I have played Roger Ailes, 
their reaction was entirely, oh, how can you play that monster? Well, you play a monster. Monsters don't think of themselves as monsters. They are all, they, in my, my guess, I'm not a monster myself. But my guess about monsters is they hate their own monstrous behavior. They wish they didn't feel compelled to behave that way. They were all, they're almost in the grips of that. And that's what I tried to project at least a little bit in these scenes. I mean, I embraced the role of the villain of the piece. There's no question. And the scene we're talking about is like the white hot molten core of this film. It, this is where we demonstrate what absolutely every woman in the film is reacting to. And both Margot and I and Charles and Jay, we all, we had a terrific meeting long before we started shooting where we talked about just what the role of this scene and this relationship is in telling the whole story. We knew what we, we knew we had to disturb people tremendously. There is another pivotal scene here, Charles, and I want to ask you about, and that's the one uh, where Kayla confronts Megan. Can you talk a little bit about some of the dynamics there between those two women? <clears throat> yeah, that's my favorite scene because it's that generate the great generational difference. I'm not in that scene. Oh, so. sorry. Second damn, favorite damn, scene. Damn. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, because it's this, great, it's this great generational conflict, right, that we see playing out right now every day uh, between a, you know a, a millennial who insists on zero tolerance and and you know a Gen Xer who you know, is dealing with the old way of seeing the world and, and being in the world. So, so uh, we really, you know, in, in the story of, a, of a, as Megan, our Megan's story is, a woman who's coming to terms with how compromised her decisions have been and allowing a, pre, a generation coming after her to be victimized, it was, it was something that, you know, really felt necessary to do and, and, and in a way is the sort of heart of, of her journey, I think, of the Megan character's journey. Um, so, so, yeah, I, I, you know, the f film history is full of people like us leaning into characters, since Citizen Kane on, who are, and we're ambivalent about. And I genuinely believe Charlize delivers on Megyn Kelly because she's so, in some ways, torn about the real underlying person. And I think that's always a sign of where you're gonna find gold, you know, as artist. You know, art complicates. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a canvas, not a mirror. And so it's really just about leaning into those things that, that scare us and, and, and are complicated. And that dynamic felt like one of those moments where, you know, we could really show exactly sort of what's going on in, in, in that place in, in a way that was a little bit surprising. Yeah. Charles, John, Jay, thank you so much.